not to be like the world and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. You can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Hello, humble bees. Welcome to Tulips and Honey. Hi, humble bees. Welcome back to Tulips and Honey. I'm your host, Lauren, and I am joined today by a brother in Christ, Jordan Wiggle. Wiggle, am I? How do we pronounce your last name here? Because it's like an epic Wiggle last name. With an R. Wiggle, Wiggle, Wiggle. Okay. Wriggle. Say it again. Wiggle. Wiggle. I like it. Okay. That's a really cool last name. I mean, if I could pick a name, I would want it to be something fun like that. So, brother, you have an audio book website you so jordan riggle dot or jordan riggle audiobooks.com right that's your website yeah uh the easiest way for people to remember is, is just my name jordan riggle.com it redirects okay. my site oh great okay well that does make it easier and listeners there's of course uh links down below in the descriptions for you to ke- check out all of his awesome stuff before we talk about your audiobook website though i always love to start out by by giving our audience the testimony of whoever we're talking to. So you are, uh, your website says you're 29. Is that, is that still how old you are now? I am. Yeah. I turn 30 in two months. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So at what point in your almost 30 years did you get saved by the grace of God? I was saved actually five years ago. Um, I made a profession, however, at six years old, my father, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, Praise God. My father's a pastor. My mother's since gone to be with Christ. Um, and so my father is an amazing expositor. I grew up with Charles Spurgeon, Jonathan wow. Edwards, John Bunyan on the shelves, regularly used. Um, so I made a profession at six. I am now convinced it was false. I wasn't a Christian all the way up. I got through high school. And then, um, once I moved out to college, I just said, I'm done. I'm done with Christ. I'm done with the church. I'm done with uh, my family. I just left everything and kind of like Solomon, whatever I wanted, whatever I saw, whatever I, uh, anything I wanted, I, I, I did it and, um, uh, got married, um, had a daughter left them. I was like, I'm done. Um, and got with my current wife. Um, and I know divorce is like a big thing in the re- reform community. Um, so if you disagree with, you know, whatever might have happened, whatever your position on divorce is, please be charitable, listeners. <laughs> um, please uh, don't right. send me horrible Facebook messages or anything. Um, yeah, we but, forward all of the negative, all of the hate mail to my producer, um, my two-year-old golden doodle. So she um, uh, she handles all all hate mail. So don't I worry. That's one of those. Yeah, she's fantastic. She doesn't have a pulsable thumb, so she can't actually respond, and she also can't read, but we still forward them to her. That's so. the ideal situation right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead, brother. Uh, so we were having our, our first child, um, my wife and I, and she was like, all right, it's time for us to go to church. And I was like, I, I don't want to go to church. Like, I don't believe any of, of Christianity. Like, why would I be in church? And she was like, well, it's time for us to grow up. Grownups go to church. And so we went to this very liberal um, um, kind of a mega church kind of feel. They had fogs and lasers and the pastor bought his sermons online and then just kind wow. of laid his own, his own um, examples. And so I started listening to this and just like poking holes in his sermon because I was trained pretty well in hermeneutics by my dad just growing up. And so I would like turn to my wife and be like, listen, this isn't what the passage is saying. Like the pastor is clearly like stupid and this is stupid. Why are we here? And all of a sudden, uh, as the the months go by, I find myself reading scripture in my off time, not in church, (laughs) to prove to my wife that Christianity is wrong and this pastor is stupid. (laughs) And then all of a sudden more months go by and I am reading because I'm interested and I can't put my, there's not an exact date where um, I can put my thumb on it and just say, 
this is when Christ saved me. Mm-hmm. But there was a period of my life where it was very clear, either I keep living my own way or I humble myself before the God of the universe who has spoken through scripture. Mm-hmm. And, and thanks to the grace of God, which is irresistible in my point <laughs> of view, um, I couldn't resist any longer. And then it became uh, the first year of me being saved was just God rooting out of my life sins that have no business in yeah. any any follower of Christ's life, right? Like, just right. get them out. He did a lot of demolishing <laughs> and rebuilding back up. And then year number two was mostly focused on um, what does it look like to be a Christian in a family, how to be a good father and a husband, um, um, in the power of Christ, not just on my own. And then right. now uh, year number three and onward, it's it's now very much, okay, what does it look like to be a Christian in community, in a local church? Uh, and now, now how can I serve the church universal? Wow. That's really cool that there was those steps, those processes that you, that you took through that. I mean, I'm sure that happens to all of us, but probably most of us aren't aware that there are steps being taken like that. So it's cool looking back that you can see. So you, so you were raised in like a, like a real legitimate reformed household. That's really fascinating. What, was there anything that happened growing up that pulled you away from the church? Was there, was it like evolution or just the sin of the world? What, what was it specifically that sort of snapped for you? No, um, I was just very clearly not interested in there being a God. If you push me intellectually, I would have, admitted there has to be some sort of prime mover it's probably the god of the bible christianity has a solid world view without any chinks or cracks in it um but i did not want there to be a god right. and so i said uh better to rule in hell than to serve <laughs> in heaven i just did not want anything to do with god which is the essence of the sin nature right it's mm-hmm. not primarily an intellectual problem it's a it's right. a heart problem and an emotional problem We don't want there to be a God. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we shake our fists and say, I am the master of my own soul. I'm the captain of my own ship. I can do what I want. Um, Even if intellectually I am convinced that there's, that there's probably a God. Yeah. What what is it? Um, It wasn't evolution. It wasn't any sort of intellectual position. It was all, I I find that in my own personal walk with Christ, um, I can't stray very far. Um, I, I think I think two months is my maximum. Where if 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 I say, um, for whatever reason, my walk grows cold with Christ, I'm I'm a very strict thought pattern kind of person. Mm-hmm. Where if my emotions get misaligned from the truth of Scripture and the grace of Christ my behavior rapidly follows. I can't exist right. in kind of a, um, uh, a heart mind mismatch. Uh, right. I believe Francis Schaeffer called it uh, a point of tension mm-hmm. where a lot of people can just um, profess the truths of Christianity and, and still exist um, within a local church. But Outside of the church, they just, you know, they look exactly like the world. There's no, right. um, there's no fruitful outgrowth. Yeah. It's like a delusion. I mean, I was in that. That, that, uh, that would sound really harsh, but just for anybody listening, I did that for over a decade. I was definitely two different people. And, and it was just deluding myself into believing that there were like um, steps that I could take to save myself. It's really, I mean, I had an idol. I had a God that I had created in the image that I wanted to uh, make him in. And it, it, it was very conflicting if I ever stopped to really think about the things that, that I was even professing. So I think that that's, that's really fascinating that there's, there's just some people that God gives that grace to where he just says, no, everybody else can be deluded, but you, you're going to have to really wrestle with <laughs> this. And and so that's really fascinating. So what was that like for you? Was there an inside battle happening? And how could we as Christians, if, if there was somebody that we were trying to share the gospel with that was in that same situation, what could somebody have said to you at that time that would have been helpful? Um, my parents modeled it beautifully. Um, they, you know, I, I 
cut myself mostly off from my parents. Um, but they kept reaching out and saying, you know, we still love you. Uh, you're our son. Um, you, you know, no matter what you do, we'll never sever ties with you unless like, you do something like murder somebody and go to jail. We'll <laughs> still visit you in jail. Um, but at the same time, they never compromised their, their beliefs. I knew exactly where they stood. Um, not in a harsh way, not in a, uh, an aggressive way. Um, but just Jordan, you're living in sin. You know, we won't help you sin. Um, so they never give me money. They, you know, but they were, they were there, um, letting me know that, that, uh, they still loved me. And so if you, if you have somebody living in a aggressive sin patterns, <clears throat> um, so my best friend growing up, um, became a lesbian and her parents had to walk through how do we love they now have uh grandchildren together how do we love this family that we disagree with its whole fundamental structure right um so when you have somebody living in aggressive sin patterns i'm trying to figure out how to phrase this because i've only been on the receiving end i've never yeah. been on the giving end right, um right. there there's a a, a Grace filled the line of knowing what to say, when to say it. I don't think there's an exact formula. Um, that th this would be where Paul's um, living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, mm -hmm. would be extremely important um, yeah. because in certain situations, human wisdom kind of is inadequate. Right. And so I'm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Question, and I yeah. thought about it a lot. So I am. I'm going to say, um, spirit-led, grace-filled truth. Yeah. Um, if you have a friend, a, a family member living in an aggressive pattern of sin, they need to know where you stand, but at the same time, they need to know uh, you're not going. Anywhere. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I think that that makes a lot of sense for, for anybody that's listening. And hopefully that'll be helpful. I have a lot of people reach out to me that are dealing with, um, in particular, children that are that have gone astray. So hopefully this yeah. will also just be a blessing for, for people to know that you you were astray. Now your your father at least is getting to see you be in the faith. Did your mom, was she still alive whenever you uh, were saved five years ago? She did, actually, yeah. Um, oh, praise God. That's great. I bet she was so excited about that. She was, she was actually, she passed away from cancer and her death caused, uh, my brother and sister who were both, who had both left the faith to come back. And so, oh, wow. uh, she said just before she died, uh, if it takes me dying for you children to all come to Christ, it's worth it. Oh, uh, she, oh yeah, she was an amazing woman. So if you are a parent out there listening to this, uh, be faithful and, and perhaps God will, will show mercy to your children. Yeah. I think it was uh, John Calvin that said that, uh, the believer usually has some sort of conflict, whether it's with a spouse or with children or, or with another family member that we usually have that, uh, conf that confliction that helps grow us in, in our faith. So, Wow, that praise God for that. What an exciting thing. So you're so now you have are they just the two siblings? Are they all they're all in the uh in the faith now? Wow, that must be really exciting for your dad. Yeah. That's great. Uh, okay. So so here at this point, you're you're saved five years ago and you like you mentioned, you're going through the steps of a God sanctifying you, he's growing in you in grace and knowledge. And so what brought you to the point? where you wanted to do these audiobooks because I'm dyslexic. So audiobooks are pretty much the only way I'm going to be able to read. Um, yeah, I mean, that's I where can, you live, huh? Yes, I can drudge through books, but it's it's work if I've got to like really sit and read it. But audiobooks is it's just like a dream come true for all of us <laughs> dyslexic kids. Yeah, so um <clears throat> really it's an issue for me of sanctification, right? Um I'm a firm believer that all you all a Christian needs to be sanctified is scripture and the Holy Spirit. Um, 
but God has given helps, great helps. Um, <clears throat> um, the local church is huge. Uh, the church universal throughout the ages um, is also huge. And we can only contact the church universal throughout the ages via books, right? We have this enormously rich tradition um, coming down to us. Um, you could almost call it a family history, yeah. right? A yeah. family conversation coming down to us throughout the ages of godly men and women, uh, some who suffered and died for their faith, and not just their faith, but for specific truths, right? Like Athanasius and yeah. and um, the, the Godhead of Jesus Christ. These men and women have left us um, valuable resources that aid us in our sanctification. And so to not avail ourselves, especially in this modern era, era where books are so cheap, Audiobooks help people that have difficulty reading. Um, you know, ebooks are practically like I bought the entire works of Jonathan Edwards for $2. Wow. A, right? Like you can buy enormous swaths of theological resources, fictional resources, uh, very, very cheaply. Mm-hmm. And so not to avail yourself of that is to cut yourself off from a potentially rich area of sanctification a tool that god can use powerfully in your life for sanctification and um i've always loved reading myself and once i became saved um and and started joining facebook groups interacting with people online um a lot of things started to jump out um a lot of modern people, even in the reformed com- community ecosphere that I exist in, read primarily modern authors, mm-hmm. right? So John Piper, R.C. Sproul, mm-hmm. John MacArthur, um, Ligon Duncan, these sorts of guys. Right. And very rarely move backwards in time, um, <clears throat> which gives a peculiar flavor uh, to their faith right? In, in, in that it's not connected to the church universal. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I, I read his introduction to Athanasius, is um, on the incarnation where he talks about if you truly want to um, develop a rich theological structure, you need to get out of your own era. Because right. every era has its own pitfalls, its own emphases, its own weaknesses, its own strengths. And so by getting into other centuries, you start to develop theological muscle and mm-hmm. and see what other people saw in scripture that our own age has either let fall by the wayside or overemphasized or that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then the audiobook industry to me just fascinating um um people like yourself with this dyslexia or people with jobs that require a lot of singular attention like truck drivers right. um that they aren't able to do a mono track activity like reading a book but they can do a dual activity like listening to an audiobook while you're driving um or my wife listens to podcasts and audiobooks while she's doing the dishes or cleaning the house yeah, or exactly. you know, walking around with a kid on her hip. She can do a lot of stuff and then just pause the book. Whereas if she sits down and cracks open a book, it's like a magnet and all our children just come like, yes. you know, <laughs> like mom, so tried to accurate. a moment yes. of silence. How dare she? Yes. Uh, yes. yes, absolutely. Audio books uh, allow us to take those chinks of time and mm-hmm. use them to, good effect rather than just turning on the latest music or, or, you know, what have you zoning out in our thoughts. Uh, right. It allows us to redeem the time Yeah. and audio books. Re- re- reading is a very 
specialized activity. Not a lot of people actually read books. Right. And then to read theological books from another century right. operate, operating at a high level is more rare. Um, <clears throat> most people are set up to be oral listeners. Um, reading is a relative newcomer on the scene, right? Sure. So if you think about Homer, um, Plato, these guys mostly dealt in the oral spoken word. Yeah. And, and as humans, um, I used to be a social scientist with the university of Michigan. Most people. Oh, that's so are, cool. Yeah. So I, I wasn't like a professional reading was part of my job in connection to being a social scientist. Oh, um, neat. Yeah, it was, it's not as glamorous as it sounds. <laughs> uh, Are you sure it sounds really yeah. glamorous? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we were collecting all the information Congress uses to pass laws. Uh, so I got yelled at a lot because people <laughs> don't like their Social Security or their Medicare or Medicaid. Oh, you're right. That's not gl- that's not. Yeah, people, people people go off. Um, but the data is becoming more and more clear that. Very few people have the the musculature in their eyes. Reading is a very um, physical activity for mm-hmm. your eyes, and so um, some people just have weak eye muscles with, that don't allow them to read quickly. Right. Um, some people have cognitive inabilities to translate the page to their brain. They're more oral oriented. Yeah. Um, actually, quite a few people. Most people are mm-hmm. oral oriented. And so audiobooks allow um they're a conduit for people to take a specialized activity and turn it into a much more generalized activity that then can be used to fill in the chinks of their time. Yeah. Um so my own personal setup is when I want to go deep into a book, I use a physical book, mark it up, um really tear into it, right? Mm-hmm. I then use audiobooks to get a grand sense of the narrative of church and theological history. Oh, that makes sense. Um, So if I'm really tearing into a book, I'm sitting down, I'm only reading. Uh, But I can listen to a Puritan author. um, I can listen to Augustine. I can listen to Athanasius. Older authors especially our tradition has taken them and just enveloped them so deeply into our Christian conversation. Um, like Athanasius's view on the Trinity and the Godhead of Jesus Christ, for example, it's taught in basic Sunday school class, right? It's so foundational that you, you almost absorb it through the cultural air. Mm-hmm. And so there's nothing new in Athanasius that a Christian wouldn't, already know from the age of like five if you grew up in the church but it's an important thing to read or listen to he says it beautifully Mm -hmm. makes beautiful arguments um but you can kind of do it with one eye on the kids yeah washing dishes Mm -hmm. and listening at the same time because if you sit down and try and really concentrate and tear it apart there's good stuff there um but it's kind of rehashing what is theology 101 to us. Right. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I hadn't considered that. I love my, my whole reasoning for wanting to go back and read these guys like Athanasius or um, Justin Martyr. I, I, I just, it's so cool. Like Ignatius, we can read, it's just cool to me. I'm just like, we can yeah. read these guys. Their stuff lasted throughout those years. And, and we can just, as like modern day people, I can just pick up my phone and I can, I can read this. It's insane. So I mean, I printed those off whenever I became a new believer and realized that we could. I, I out of nowhere, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to print these off so that I can have them. And and I wanted to do that. I wanted to tear it apart, just like you were saying. But there is so much in there that really is repetitive. But what ended up being wonderful was whenever the Mormons knocked on my door and they wanted to talk <laughs> about the Council of Nicaea. I was like, hey, I have I have um, some stuff over here already printed that you know that would be really helpful for you guys. They wouldn't take it, but it was, you know, at least it was there that there's, there's history, the church history that we have that we can use whenever we're, when we're evangelizing, especially the cults, but just in general, that's such a great point. And 
for me as a mom, I focus better on the little tasks that I need to do. Like if I'm going to fold laundry, if I have an audio book in, I'm man, I can fold that laundry way better. If I have an audio <laughs> book in, I don't get distracted by, you know, anything. So I'm not otherwise. And I, maybe I'm, I'm just like really weird, but I'll be folding laundry. And I'll be like, did I start those dishes? I don't think I started those dishes. I better go start those dishes. And the laundry gets forgotten and it's there for a week, but the dishes are done. <laughs> and then I'm moving on to like 10 other, t- other topics. But if I have something playing in my ear, I can really focus in on whatever it is I'm doing because my brain is being, um, it's being taken care of too. So whatever tedious thing I'm dealing with. And then like you mentioned, redeeming the time, let us, this is a wonderful way to do it. So you have some experience with audiobooks, and I usually, whenever, whenever I recommend before I, before I knew about your website, I used to rep, reprimand, recommend LibriVox. And they yeah. have some of the older stuff. But as you're listening through, each chapter is usually read by somebody different. Their accents can be very strong. The quality is not very um, top. I mean, they're volunteers. It, uh, yeah. that's, that's what it is. And so yeah. if for, for people like me, that little accent, that small little change of things can really disrupt my ability to get that overall picture like you were saying. So so you had some some like practice before you ended up doing all this what was the path that that you went on like was it on purpose was it accidental did you always have this in your mind or did it just sort of end up this way I would love to say that I am as wise and foreseeing as to be able to like plan this (laughs) absolutely not Uh, it just was something I stumbled onto uh, a mish a mishmash of um uh, listening to Jordan Peterson talk about the rise of audiobooks and kind of it clicking in my brain that, wow, lots of people listening listening to this. Um, lots of Christians aren't getting the old, um, time-tested, deep theological uh, books. They're, they're mainly hanging out with Piper and, and, and R.C. Sproul, who I love, both of those guys. Um, but, and then, there's no real option uh, uh, unless you're talking like a subscription to Audible or LibriVox, you know. Right. And even then, $15 yeah. a month yep. plus, however, you know, you're only allowed to get for the $15 a month, I think like what, one or two books, something like it that. Is, and if you yeah. buy more, mm-hmm. you got to pay more. Um, audio books are really expensive and there's really not a, a massive amount of older audio books. Like, I think the John Calvin's institutes are like sixty bucks on Amazon. <laughs> that and I, is insane. And I, 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 you know, I'd love to offer it for five. Just mm-hmm. super cheap, easy to, to listen to, pay attention to, decent quality. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not a professional um, audio person, uh, so I'm not using you know a hundred dollars <laughs> worth of suites. I'm not going to a music mm-hmm. studio. But I can get ninety percent of the way there right. for you know a tenth of the cost. Sure, sixty bucks on it, Audible. Sixty bucks. Nobody is. I mean, how many how many young people are going to be able to even do that? That's why I get whenever I I have audio Audible, and I didn't realize I had Audible for a long time. So I had collected all of these like uh, free Audible. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this huge amount of like little points there and I was like, what are these points for? What, you know, what is, what is this? When did I sign up for this? I had been collecting these for like a year and I didn't know it. So I like to give away auto audio books once, once a month on our, on our group because they are very expensive Yeah, and, and not a lot of people, especially not right now with everything happening with the pandemic, but you mentioned that you're not professional, but you have been voiceovers and commercials. I have. Yes. Uh, my cool. in-laws are both videographers. Uh, and apparently I have a certain kind of voice that they like. So, <laughs> um, they put me in commercials that they film and, I love uh, that. that is so cool. Yeah. So like credit cards and all sorts of stuff that I don't use personally, but <laughs> I got paid for it. So, yeah, that's all that matters. Can we hear like your best commercial voice real quick? Ladies and gentlemen, I come to you promoting MasterCard. <laughs> Don't actually use it. Just get the points. Spend it on hotels. <laughs> that is fantastic. I love it. That is Remember, great. the borrower is slave to the lender. 
<laughs> and then, you know, you get a, a cool mic and then you can yeah. do all sorts of cool things on the audio software and like raise the bass and you can get a real like God voice going on. You know? <laughs> I know, right? Awesome. I started playing with some of that stuff a while back and I just ended up with like putting us on fast forward. So we were like, yeah, you know, I, I shouldn't play with buttons. It's okay. <laughs> um, well, okay. So thank you for that. I really, I'm really excited about this. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what your website is? What, what books you have there and, and which ones are your favorite to, to actually do the um, audio books for? Okay. So, um, if you go to my website, uh, there's the welcome page, and then I've done three main books, Athanasius's On the Incarnation, John Calvin's A Little Book on the Christian Life, which you referenced earlier. Uh, that's actually where he talks about uh, God sanctifying us, and God will always put either a spouse or a child or another church member, right? That just oh, yes. That our gears. Um, and so how do we deal with that in faith and humility? And then uh, my personal favorite right now, well— my favorite is always the last book I recorded. Um, but I did Jeremiah Burroughs, a little of uh, the rare jewel of Christian contentment, which was absolutely eye opening for me. Uh, contentment, he says, is the sum and total of all practical divinity. So if I could um, point you to one book, right? So if you're a busy mom listening to this and you just don't have time to get into Jonathan Edwards or John Calvin or uh, you know, you don't have the emotional energy or you're a busy dad or a pastor. All practical Christianity comes down to how to be content with the will of God. Mm -hmm. right? And so Jeremiah Burroughs really gets into how to be content in wow. any and all circumstances. Uh, he unfolds Paul in Philippians. I've learned in whatever circumstances I am in how to be content. Yeah. Uh, so that one is probably going to be my favorite for a while. Yeah, that um, sounds fantastic. I'm going to look into that after I get done with this yeah, interview, it's, actually. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, so I've done three major projects, and then I've also read the Orthodox creeds. Uh, I think those are very important and much neglected in our modern era. Um, and so I love the thought of just listening to the creeds so often that you memorize them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've... Uh, then C.S. Lewis's introduction to Athanasius, um, which is just a jewel of an essay on why why we should read, um, why it's important, how to do it well. Yeah. Um, so all the books are five dollars or under. I don't want to go over five dollars uh, because that's pretty much my own personal limit. Yeah, um, right. that I would ever sell, that I would ever buy a, uh, an audio book for. And, um, you know, my wife and I don't have a lot of extra disposable income. So if we can afford five bucks, most people can. Right. And, uh, when you buy one of my audio books, uh, you have to download two apps because the audio files are so large. Mm -hmm. I have to zip them. And then your right. phone can't unzip them automatically. I think it's kind of dumb that it doesn't do it automatically. So you have to give your phone superpowers. Right. And uh, there are two free superpowers that you download right on my site really fast. And then you can play and listen to the audiobooks. Um, you don't have to re-download the apps every time you buy a book. It's just like a one-time deal so that oh, your phone cool. gets zazzed up and can do <laughs> awesome stuff. That's pretty cool. I like <laughs> and then that. I've got That's a couple neat. other people for me just kind of uh kind of as a collective and then um if a book if an audio book doesn't help your faith your walk with christ um we have a 110 percent return policy um so if it we are so confident that the books we bring out will help your walk with christ that you can return it uh, and we'll actually pay you 110% back. So rather than 100% wow. back, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> That's pretty cool. Kind of, yeah, because, um, you know, a lot of businesses can stand behind their name. Amazon and Audible uh, have kind of built a reputation. And so this is just a way for us to um, 
jumpstart a reputation for excellence and quality and to help our listeners and our audience uh, feel comfortable and confident that that we have high standards for the books, mm-hmm. for the quality of the production. Um, and so you don't need to be wondering, well, if I like spend this money and the time and like download all this stuff and, and, and what happens if I don't like it? Well, we will right. pay you more money than <laughs> Cause <laughs> so, you are going to like it. These are great yes. books. You will like it. Yeah. Yes. That's so cool. And, Very cool. Um, we've never had a return. So, um, Try it out, and you could be the first person to get one hundred and ten percent back, dear listener. <laughs> yes, don't do that on purpose, though, just to get extra money. No, we that have software terrible. that tracks that sort of thing. So if you do do that, uh-huh. <laughs> you've got it all figured out already. What? <laughs> what? It, it, so people can download them on their phone. Can they download them on Macs and laptops? Yep. Thing and too. Yeah. Okay, so, so if you download to your computer, your computer does have the um, okay. unzipping quality um i don't listen on my computer i don't really know anybody who does do you listen to audiobooks on your computer no i don't but for lessons my daughter does so she, we, we homeschool oh, so there, there have been times that she's had to uh, most of she's got a she's got a tablet most of the time i can just put it on her tablet but there have been a couple of times when something didn't want to unzip on the phone or the tablet and i have had to do it on the um the computer recently because i'm in a small group well it's not too small but i'm in a group of people that are um they're reading Ray Comfort's new book before it's published so that we can sort of review it. Mm-hmm. I, it downloading that was a challenge. <laughs> it was really, really difficult, but I mean, it did take, like you're mentioning several steps. So that's pretty, that's pretty normal for, I think we're, wherever we're at with our phones right now, hopefully in the future, they'll get technology that, that downloads books a little yeah, bit easier. Super simple to do. Yeah. Uh, and with everybody doing audiobooks now and large PDFs, um, I don't know. Google, get on that. I know, right? Geez, where are you at, Google? So what right? are you working on now? Like, what, what books are you going to be doing in the future? Uh, so I am pretty sure I'm going to move on to Jonathan Edwards. Uh, I might do, like, a Jonathan Edwards translation because he can be rather dense and use esoteric words. Mm-hmm. Um, so I might translate a couple of his essays. Uh... I hear that a lot whenever I talk to people about why, why are you not reading past our century? The main reason I hear is that there is a language difference. Like there, there's a disconnect in the way that, that people used to write and the way that we talk today. So I bet that would be really helpful because I have, I have heard that complaint. I mean, when you've read them enough, you just get used to it and it's not that big of a deal, but I guess it can be intimidating from the start. Yeah. And I mean, just Edwards is intimidating in general, <laughs> right? Like, it's yeah. like, good night. <laughs> you know, I read The End for Which God Created the World a couple years ago, and it was like, it was like a marathon, like sat down, pen in hand. I'm like diagramming. I felt like I was back in- <laughs> like just diagramming these sentences just to know like, what in the world is this guy talking about? What is um, but he has a couple essays he wrote. Um, on the first and second great awakening on how to discern an act of God, Mm -hmm. right? So these huge awakenings happen and Edwards is very concerned because all sorts of weirdness popped up, right? right, In people's thinking. Um, And so he, he was very concerned with how do we discern what is a true act of God and what is just human emotion run amok? And I think that is a very important lesson for modern times as well we have a lot of stuff swirling around we're trying to figure out a lot of theological issues regarding sexuality and gender um you know revoice conference all sorts of like massive things and we're wondering like is this an act of god uh what's going on here and so one of the greatest theologians in church history wrote an answer how do you know what's an act of god um, so, and then I'll probably go back to the church fathers once I'm done with Edwards, uh, and do some church father, uh, theological writings. I think they are <clears throat> the most misunderstood of church history because people go to them expecting something like a Jonathan Edwards or a John Calvin. Right. Uh, and that's not who they are. 
-hmm. We have had the benefit of 2,000 years of theological refinement and polishing, and they've only had, what, 200, 300 years. (laughs) Yeah. To think through what in the world is is Paul saying in this epistle? What is Hebrews really saying? How do we fit? Uh, how do we fit grace with our ecclesiology? Ecclesiology, you know, our yeah. conception of the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, Augustine really wrestled with that, and I don't think he came to a satisfactory conclusion. But they go in expecting like a Herman a Herman Bovink, super rigorous, super detailed. It's more like a forest, right? It's just like <laughs> yes. this tangled mass of yeah. thoughts and 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 reflections, and some of it's wrong, and some of it sounds a lot like legalism to us now. And we're right. like, what in the world? How do we deal with this? Uh, and, <laughs> and so I would love to take on that and say, here's how you approach the early church fathers. Um, here's how to get the most out of them. Uh, kind of, you know, eat the meat and spit out of the bo- spit out the bones. Right. Um, I'd love to do that. But the church fathers um, are kind of where I hang out. The church fathers, the reformers. So um, I'll be doing a lot of Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, uh, Melactathon, and then the Puritans um, moving from like, you know, early 1500s to kind of Jonathan Edwards is the last, last gasp of the Puritans. And then kind of the more modern people like Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, that sort of thing. Um, And I'm focusing mainly on the, that's who I am. Um, But I would love to expand given the time, Mm -hmm. uh, moving into other, other denominations that, that might not be exactly in step with what I believe, but I still believe there's in Christ. Right. Oh, I love that. I think that's really, really exciting. So one more um, really serious question, and then I have a few silly questions before we can uh, sign out here. But if you um, if you had to like suggest a percentage, and this goes this goes back to kind of like what we were talking about earlier, where, where you know, you, there's really some some liberty here where we have to walk walk by the spirit. But I hear from a lot of people that rather than reading anything like this, that we really just need to be in in the word. And so what, what, what would you say to somebody that just says, Hey, we don't need these audio books. We just need to be reading scripture. Um, wait, how, how would you address that specifically? So I am in the supplement business, right? So I like, if you work out, I sell supplements. That's what I do. Really? Uh, oh, I didn't know that. It, 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 it's, a, it, it's a workout metaphor, right? No, 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 no. So the audio books are supplements. <laughs> okay. <It's a> <laughs> okay. Uh, I yeah, maybe I wasn't clear there. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it, 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 it's a workout, right? Audio books, theology books, uh, John Calvin, Augustine, they're supplements, right? Scripture is daily meals. Right. Calvin and Augustine and Jeremiah Burroughs, without having read scripture today, if you are listening to this podcast without having read scripture today, right. stop. Yeah. <laughs> go read scripture right now. Yeah. Right? Um that, that is first. Absolutely. Primary focus. Um and then these just fill in the chinks, the cracks, mm-hmm. right? Um if you have if you have the time to sit down for an hour a day and read a theology book, that is amazing. Um if if you're a busy husband or wife and all you have time for is um, to listen to audiobooks on the commute to and from work, if your commute is 20 minutes uh, there and then 20 minutes back, you can get through the institutes in about three months. Right? Oh, wow. That's so cool. Um, so these are supplements. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've interacted with some people online, Facebook. <laughs> Where any sort of additional in is to be shunned. Right. Um, that is not where I land. I believe God gave us um, everything we need for uh, life and sanctification in Scripture, but it's not laid out logically. 
it's an organic mass, um, like a live, it's like an ecosystem. And we're allowed to use um, spirit led reason mm -hmm. to build upon the, the sure foundation of scripture. Right. And, and that's a process that takes place throughout time. Mm -hmm. Right. So all sorts of people have expounded all sorts of weird stuff based on only scripture. Right. But we want to evaluate it throughout throughout history. What have what have great men and women of the faith all unanimously agreed? Um, right. And and I was just reading Herman Bobbing today. He's talking about this very issue. Um, we are allowed to to reason about scripture um, and then to write down our reasonings to inform other people logically right. um and and to not avail yourself of that is to leave yourself open to your own heart yeah. uh, because the heart is desperately wicked right who mm -hmm. can know it and while the holy spirit does refurbish and um renovate and create a new heart right it's this side of glory, never going to be entirely free of its own biases, its own um, deceptions, its own yearnings for what you want to be true. Right. Which is why we have um, different denominations and different sects in the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox and Baptists and Anglicans, right? Because we all, we're not all right. It, right. Um, a lot of people are very wrong about some major <laughs> issues. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's due to the sinful nature of the human heart. And so to just say, well, it's just me and my Bible <laughs> and, and maybe my local pastor, right? right. I'll, I'll let him inform me. Really what you're doing is you're allowing your heart to be shepherded by men and women throughout the ages. Right. And it helps overcome that sort of narrow um, bias where you're not quite sure what spirit led and what is your own your own wantings as you look at scripture. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I mean, we have the body of Christ for a reason. So it's kind of like where, how you were explaining the early church fathers and, and the way that they had to wrestle with the text. If we if we lost all of church history and we had to start over, we would be starting right where they were at. And we would have to re-wrestle with all these things. And yeah. it would still take generation after generation after generation to to really iron those things out. And I think it's really fascinating to me that a lot of those early um, church fathers, they were alive while Paul was alive or while John was alive. And so they definitely could have just been told, like, stop it. Don't write anything else. Just read scripture. And they weren't. They have writings that they wrote down back then, too. So I think that's really, really helpful. Okay, I have two really not... Um, serious questions for you because this was some heavy material. So here are two silly, super silly questions. The first one is um, if you could meet any of these people who you plan on reading the books for, who would you want to meet? Uh, I know. Uh, why would you ask that? <laughs> <laughs> Pick your favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when people ask me, what's your favorite book? I'm always like, yeah. what genre? Like, how about I go with an author? Um, <laughs> Oh man, I am a huge Jonathan Edwards fan. Um, I think he, more than anyone else I've read, really gets at what it means to be uh, the glory of God oriented. Yeah. Right? Total focus upon the glory of God and what it what it means to worship the Trinity, right? This being that we have no conception well except what he has explained to us but like right. we just can't fathom exactly. um, yep. but augustine That'd be also pretty cool. like he he is the the theologian par excellence mm -hmm. like everybody you read all the reformations throughout church history always go back to scripture and augustine yep right he raises Every possible question that you can, you, you can um, raise in the Christian life, and he answers most of them 
solidly. Like I would agree with him. Um, so which one, Augustine or Edwards? Augustine oh. or Ed? Um, probably Edwards. I would probably, probably go with Edwards. Edwards just because. Um, if I had to pick any theologian who has formed my my own personal theology and my own thinking, it would be Edwards. Uh, so, so I read John Piper's Desiring God a long time ago, a couple of years, and and then I and I was like blown away. I was like, wow, this is worldview shifting. <laughs> and then I went to Edwards and I read Jonathan Edwards and I was like, you dog, John Piper, <laughs> you built this huge ministry by ripping off John. <laughs> And, you know, Piper says that all the time. He's like, you know, he's open about saying that. But, like, it's just all recycled Edwards, most of it. Piper's a giant, obviously. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, he he formed my theology more more than any other theologian. And and he wasn't just a brilliant thinker. The stories of him uh, walking along riverbanks and and worshiping. Shipping and weeping um, as a regular occurrence are just incredible. Here's a man yeah. who thought deeply and felt powerfully, uh, yeah. uh, which is which is my own personal aspiration. I want to think deeply and I want to feel powerfully. Um, I want the you know to use another metaphor of of worship as a to be large, right? the logs of my thoughts to be large and I want to throw them on the blaze of my heart and, and build that sucker up right to a bonfire. Oh, um, that's a great analogy. Yeah. 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 That's, Definitely. you know, uh, theology books are simply uh, logs on hopefully stir up right. worship. Right. Yeah. We don't, we aren't just ac- academics. We don't just think intellectual thoughts. We think so that we can worship better, yeah. um, more powerfully, more deeply, um, be more in awe of the mysterious triune God who is three in one and one in three and and undergirds all the structure of reality. And um, and Edwards more. Than- yeah. Oh, that was a great answer. Wow. Now I want to go and read more Edwards. Okay, this last one, though, is going to take things in a little bit of a different direction. Recently on Instagram, I saw one of my my friends, one of Citroen Christ and follower of the podcast, eating roasted grasshoppers. And she asked the question, oh. would you eat roasted grasshoppers? So I am now oh. asking you this question. And she ate them. She was like, they taste like sunflower seeds. And I was shocked because she was just like, like it was it was nothing. So what about you, brother? Would you eat roasted grasshoppers dip them in chocolate for me and <laughs> and i'd go for it really? I, I don't know if i'd do it like just straight up uh roasted grasshopper <laughs> probably because it would be more of like a visual thing for me right like i'd grab it by the little hind leg and i know and, and i just see like the other leg and the antenna coming out of the head and like the beady little eyes and i'd just be holding it up above my head thinking no 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 can't do oh. it but you dip it in chocolate, and all that goes away, <laughs> and you have the delicious taste of chocolate. Um, so it would be like a like a chocolate dipped sunflower seed, and then um, you know you get used to that crunch and pop. I would imagine, sure. and then you get used to kind of the sunflower seedy taste, and then you can get over the mental uh, visual aspect by itself without <laughs> a package of "I am eating a grasshopper." So you need it in steps here. There I needs need it to in be steps. okay. A, I do things in steps. We talked about this. We've already gone steps. over that. <laughs> Jordan, I am not, thank you. I don't just jump into the deep end of the pool. Not that pool. No, no. I can't do it even if it has chocolate. But I'm fascinated by the idea and and apparently they're very healthy for you. So I'm just going to keep on asking this question until I get up the courage to actually try it. Jordan, thank you so much for joining me on the program. Listeners, you can find jordanriggle.com. That'll take you to all of his audiobooks or jordanriggleaudiobooks.com. I'm probably still mispronouncing your last name, but you've been very gracious and kind. Thank you for joining me on the program, brother. Is there anything that we could be praying for you about? Uh, just this COVID-19 stuff, um, my sanity, uh, <laughs> I, I want, 
I want to go to my brewery and my cigar <laughs> lounge so badly. <laughs> this is affecting reformed men in ways that we didn't expect, okay? But there's there's other things happening here, guys. They're shaving their beards. <laughs> they are. This is dire. That's as dire as it can get right there, shaving <laughs> the beards. Brother, God bless you. You have a wonderful day. Thank you again for joining me. Thanks for listening, Humble Bees. This is Tulips and Honey. Over and out. I think that diamond still needs a little more polish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>